Hey everyone, welcome back to Citywide Blackout, your home for music, movies, and more. I'm your host, Max Bowen. In this episode, I'm getting funky with artist Francis Odd, talking about his new single, Codeine Kiss, as well as the music video released in mid-November, including a no-doubt soon-to-be-famous dog. Odd's been pretty active during the pandemic, and we talk about what he's been up to over the last year. We also take a look at some of his favorite places to play in the New York City area. And this time, folks, well, this guy is a little bit odd, but that's a good thing. I, I'm joined by a Brooklyn-based musician, Francis Odd. Francis, welcome to the show, man. It's awesome talking to you. And uh, for Thanks. all you guys listening at home, his fans are called, are called the Oddballs. And now so yeah, are you. Yeah, we're throwing it out there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are now official Oddballs just by listening yeah. to this episode. Hopefully by the end of the episode, it's legions of new oddballs, you know? <laughs> I like that plan, man. I am here for that. <laughs> right? We're I, just, yeah, this is the pitch. This is the sales pitch. And exactly. this is like, like, yeah. <laughs> like and subscribe. Exactly. <laughs> um, so there's there's certainly a lot to cover. You've been very, very busy mm. in the past, like, three years. And that's the thing that, that I, I think I want to start with is you've only yeah. recently gotten in, into music. You've been doing this since uh, t- um, uh, 2017. With your debut mm-hmm. EP, Tender Things, what happened that you wanted to pursue music? Because it didn't seem like you have a real musical background. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, and it's funny because like I um I almost used to like approach this question as sort of like a little bit shy and a little bit um self conscious, so to speak. But now that uh, now over the years, it's kind of just become a source of pride. Uh, long story short, um, I've always known that I'm music like I wanted to say probably about high school but there was a lot of uh there was a lot of external pressure so to speak in terms of like you know maybe uh you know music m- musician sounds cool but what about being a doctor or something like that um which is like I think it's I think it's like typical fair but um you know I think that I was also uh yeah I I sort of went through a bunch of growing pains musically because I was I was never really that confident or that self-assured. And so what's funny is that from the ages of about 17 to 20, I mean, 17 to 24, I like knew I wanted to do music. I was in like choir. I was in acapella groups. I was like playing music like uh, around the university that I went to. I was like studying poetry and I was eventually like writing songs and things like that. Um, and when it came, when I graduated, it came down to like, oh shoot, like the real world, you know, I kind of sort of, um, I kind of sort of like pushed the dream aside, I would say, um, just for fear of like, ah, you know, just like the sort of like the, the, the anxiety that sort of like pours in, um, whenever there's like a major life shift and you're not really ready to meet it. And so, um, it's funny, I actually went to a uh, school for social work and I was actually a, a social worker for about two years. And it's funny because I was actually working with these, um, these young adults and the whole purpose of the, I, I would help run a program that was geared towards like helping these young adults, whether it was gain work experience or like go back to school, et cetera, uh, just to sort of like help them like sort of reintegrate into like the workforce, so to speak, slash just like daily life. And um, and I had this one participant from uh, from my first cohort, we used to call them. And um, and he was he was excellent. He was fantastic. And like he like really worked his butt off. And I remember he came into my office like a year and a half later and he was like, man, I just want to let you know that like thanks to you, like I'm going to college and like, you know, and it was one of those things where it's like I was extremely happy and I like cried. And then the moment he left, I was like, oh, my God, I'm such a hypocrite. I'm like I'm trying to like inspire these kids to like go do things that they're really passionate about and like here I am sort of sitting on my thumbs and so I think that when it comes to like the busyness aspect of it um like when I made that when I flipped that switch when I was 24 turning 25 I was like I need to sort of make up for lost time so to speak and so I kind of just like went after it went after it and uh and I think also the, the music sort of reflects like it's been a lot of growth in a small period of time. So there's like a little bit, there's like a lot of stylistic differences, et cetera. But that's the, that's more or less the gist, you know? That's so cool, man. Yeah. Now, are you at a point now where this is like a full-time gig for you or are you still kind of balancing this with like another job? Mm-hmm. Well, it's actually, it's interesting that you say that. Um, and it's something that like, if I think too, too long and hard about, it's like, it can sort of like send me down the rabbit hole. Um, before COVID struck, it's actually, um, I had like, I had a bunch of gigs lined up and it was one of those things where things were going to start, like momentum was building to the point where like things would eventually become like they would, they would cross the threshold, so to speak. Um, and, uh, and you know, it's 
now, now, like most of my days are typically spent, like I'll do copywriting or copy editing work from home and then I'll work on music at night. Um, I also, it's funny cause like on the side I actually do children's music. And so I'm, I was a children's entertainer. Like I would just like go to birthday parties or like put on little mommy and me classes. And that virtual transition has definitely been like weird, but it's, it's, it's going, you know? So, um, so I would say that hopefully when things are able to you know, sort of reopen and live music is once again a thing, um, then I can sort of like get back on that track. But I think in the meantime, I don't know, this is definitely delayed it, but it's also something that like I also take with like a, you know, I take it in stride because it's definitely like birthed other opportunities that I wouldn't have been aware of. Yeah, as I'm sure it's like for you, it's just like, you know, if you have a podcast and you're like, now you have all this extra time at home, you're like, oh my God, I'm going to record a million and one podcasts, you know, it's like, yeah. And um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with that. But I, I would hope so that like within the next two years, it sort of becomes it's uh, a full time thing. I remember looking at um, uh, looking at your website and seeing some pictures of some of your past shows. You had a packed crowd and I could definitely see why, because like your music is super, super danceable. Like this is the kind Thanks. of music you don't just chill out with your beer and listen to. You'd be like on your mm-hmm. feet, moving your ass to. Style wise, though, I've definitely seen it can kind of range. Um, mm-hmm. The most recent uh, single, um, uh, Cody and Kiss, being, you know, it's a funky, poppy tune, and Thought of You is a more like mellow, chill style. Do you think you're still trying to find yourself in terms of how you're going to sound? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's funny because just like to sort of tie this answer to my first about like my whole progression with music. It's funny because I think my first project was such a, a labor of love, but it was also, it's kind of, it was kind of like pulling teeth. I think it was equal parts like labor of love and pulling teeth where I was so happy doing it, but I was also, because it was my first project and I was like so green and I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, I, it felt like every decision was so weighted. I was like, what if I do, if I sing this part, no one's going to like, me. you know? And it was like, I was sort of just like doubt at every single turn. And, um, and I definitely like, I put a lot of pressure on myself to like make that, you know, I would say as good as I could. And then subsequent releases, I've sort of like had to change my relationship to music or the like releasing music. Cause I was like, it shouldn't be stressful. Like it should be like a fun time. And the moment that I allowed myself to like write fun music is the moment that things sort of started to shift a little bit. And, um, and then the funny thing too, is that like a lot of my releases, like you mentioned, thought of you, like I, I typically record with a live band. Um, but, and that live band, you know, like with a horn section, all that stuff, like it comes out to like eight guys. Right. And so it's like eight guys and an audio engineer and a producer in a studio, 10 people in an enclosed space is pretty much like COVID's wet dream, so to speak. It's kind of just like, yeah, let's do it. And um, when COVID struck, it was like one of those things where it's like, we can't really do this the same way. Um, And then I also did have a few of the guys in the band that they were like, I'm going to weather the storm in my hometown, you know, because some of them weren't from New York originally. So um, yeah, it's just like the recent stuff. It's definitely been like me with like, you know, I've got like a little... I've got my little guitar over here. I've got like a keyboard and I've got like this little interface and just recording a lot at home and sort of using out using different instruments. And so all of that to say that, yes, it's definitely been a process of re meeting myself where I'm at. And um, so long as I, I mean, I think that like everything I put out of, I'm proud of. So I think that for, you know, for what I'm, I don't know for what it's worth, like I'm happy with it, you know? Now, you mentioned earlier that you are doing also kids' music, and mm-hmm. I'm not surprised because it definitely fits, like, your energy. Is mm-hmm. that a more, like, recent development for you? Um, it's funny because I actually, like, it's – this is – okay. I think that, like, a lot of these answers are probably going to stem from the first question that we that we spoke about. So I think that – um, it, it, I think it was a sign because after I left my job as a social worker, um, I was like, okay, I have some savings. I don't know how long these are going to last. Let's see what's out there. And two days after that happened, I had a friend post on Facebook like, hey, do I have any friends who are interested in playing music for kids? Like, it's like like low intensity. You just have to like learn the, the hits, the standards, right? And um, And I was like, hey, man, like a job playing music? Like, I will take whatever I can get my hands on, you know? And that was about three years ago as well. And so I, um, you know, I never really, I never really had a, so much for like a penchant for, uh, for, you know, being like the, for lack of a better term, the dancing monkey, like, hey guys, like, it's like, the you know, um, but it was really funny because just coming from that, that background of like being an educator, just like working with little kids in general, it's just like so fun. Um, they also, it's funny. They like, they, they'll definitely remind you of like, what's important 
so to speak. You know, it's like a kid falls and then they get up and then they're like, okay, what's next? And you're like, oh my God, you didn't just spiral out into a existential episode after you tripped and fell like what like you made a single mistake and you continued going on with your life um and so like just naturally like as i spent more time in that arena i just like the other the other great thing about it too is that especially in new york like gigs like that attracted like some of my best friends for example were people who were trying to be on broadway they were trying to like be in plays and so jobs like that really attracted like creatives and just being in that space as well sort of just like you know it um it 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 was just so much fun and it is, it, it continues to be fun from a distance, so to speak. But I think that like, so long as I, um, so long as my, my, you know, my back can keep up with running after these kids, I'm going to like continue doing it, you know? Yeah. Kids are just like adults, but minus all the emotional and psychological baggage that we baggage, accumulate over yep. the years. It's like I said, they run, mm-hmm. they fall, they get up, they run some more. There's no, yeah. They, they don't like spiral downwards into this like massive depressive hole. It's like, huh? Yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> Dude, yeah, I want to like, do yeah. shit and not worry about anything. Yeah, it's really funny. It's like one of my fondest memories. Just to go on like a side tangent really quickly, I was um I was playing music for a summer camp, and um and one of these kids like pretty much like it was dress up day, right? And I was coming in and I was gonna play music for half an hour, and this one little kid named Max, like he didn't have a he didn't have a costume, and he saw this one other child with a dragon costume, and he was like, I don't have a tail, and I was like, that's okay, and he got really sad, and I was like it's okay that you don't have a tail. And he's like, but I want a tail. And then I was like, I don't have a tail either. And then all of a sudden I like picked up my guitar and I started strumming and I was like, I don't have a tail. And all of a sudden, like 10 minutes later, like all these kids are like screaming, I don't have a tail. And they're like running around the room. And, um, it was just one of those, like, you know, like in the matter of like 20 minutes, like he was like overjoyed and just like, it was just so much fun. And it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it's a nice little reminder I guess it's funny too because it's like it's I'm sure you have things as well that's like once you engage with them you're like I think what people would call it is flow or whatever the technical term blah 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 but um it's kind of just like oh this this feels really nice and it I'm getting stuff done but it's just like it I'm contributing in some way but I'm also like being myself and yeah mm-hmm. is yeah. writing kids music easier or harder than writing music for adults um it's funny i think it's 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 both now that you mention it um i think that like on the technical side like from a technical standpoint it's pretty easy um because really all you have to do like if you want to I'll, I'll give you the five steps max it's five things the first thing is pick and pick a pick a main character um preferably a baby version of it so like let's say a panda boom you got a baby panda uh pick an activity for the panda to do um pick uh what is it pick the environment or like the setting and then the cool thing is like a lot of children's nursery rhymes etc like they only have like five or fewer melody notes you know so all you have to do is just pick five notes and then you just sing your your lyric over and over again um but i think that like on the harder side of it too i think like like you alluded to earlier it's like we have so much sort of like baggage just as adults that it's just like it's funny too, because like I'll also teach lessons, and I think something that comes up in the lessons, and something that I see happens to kids that are growing up, and like also see in adults, is that like you doubt like your first thought. You know, you're like, I think this is a good idea, and then immediately it's like, Are you sure that's a good idea, or is it really stupid? It's like that little that that voice. You know, that voice just comes out of nowhere, and um, and in that respect, I think it's exponentially harder to write kids' music because you're allowing yourself to be as simple as you can be. And it's difficult for adults. Yeah. Yeah, it's really hard to turn that kind of thing off. I think as we get older, we just like flip the switch, then we mm-hmm. take that switch and we smash it with a with a, uh, a hammer. Because we yeah. what, I think we're happier being these angsty bundles of psychological torture. Mm-hmm. And look at kids, it's like, damn. Yeah, you I, don't. I, yeah. I want to be that simple again. Yeah, there was um, there's a great book. I I don't know if you've read it. Um, it's called Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. Um, it's like this whole treatise on like like she's the woman who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, but she has this whole treatise about like her relationship with creativity. And I think that like I took one of the biggest things that I took from that was um, she has this one passage that says that like, what is it? Um, the piece of art that you make isn't what's sacred. What's sacred is that you took the time to actually like craft it. And like once I heard that, I was like, oh yeah, like that's it. Like, 
because the cool thing is another thing that um that I really learned is like the law of thirds, which is really fun. Um, one of my mentors told me this. They were like, okay, here we go. Um, imagine all the people in the world. Let's say eight billion, right? One third of those people are gonna love your art. One third of those people are gonna hate it. One third aren't gonna give a shit. And then the other percentage of people, they're just babies, right? So, like, they they have no, like, whatever. Um, and so just, like, just sort of understanding that, like, you know, 30% of 8 billion is, like, that's a lot of people. So you're not going to be lacking for people to connect with. And, yeah, I think it all is just, like, it all comes together, you know, just, I think it comes together in a way that's just, like, oh, I can I can do stuff but, like, not be miserable. Like, that's nice, you know? Yeah. yeah. I really like that thought process, too, because it's, like, I think sometimes when when folks sit down, whether they write books or make music or what have you, they want to make sure that the the time they spend results in something big. Like this mm-hmm. is a great song, or, or I mean, I I wrote an amazing chapter. Sometimes you're gonna come up with shit. Sometimes you're gonna spend a, cu- a couple hours writing a song and come up with just gobbledygook. Mm-hmm. But it's like, dude, you sat down and you did the thing. Yep. Yeah, you're not gonna put this on your next album. You may bury it in your desk drawer where it will never see the light of day. Mm-hmm. But hey, at least you did it. And, yeah. And it's better than to sit around on like, you know, Instagram for two hours. Mm-hmm. I think it's like, it also comes down to two. It's like just strengthening the muscle of like listening to yourself. It's like, because if like, if you're prone to just like, you have an idea and then you immediately write it off as dumb, then kind of like the muscle that fights against that voice is going to atrophy. It's just going to get weaker and weaker. But like the more time that you spend like exercising it, Pretty soon you'll just be like, I have this idea. I definitely don't think it's like amazing, but I'm just going to let it out, you know, and just sort of it has that has value in itself, I think. As long as you go out there, you sit down and you do the thing, Mm -hmm. you can't regret it. Yeah. Maybe it's shit, but hey, you never know what it's going to lead to down the road. You might wind up polishing it off and finding it's an absolutely amazing song. So just be proud that you at least showed up and did it. It's yeah, you know, it's something. Like when it comes to discussing art too, or like music, for example, I always get to like, I always, I I sort of approach every conversation of like, whether or not you like it is like on you and like, that's cool. And like, I like it, but I already made the thing. And so it's for you to judge. So like, let's actually just talk about like human things, you know, it's kind of just like, I I, like, cause the other thing too, is that like, I've been in situations where it's like, we can have like the very music nerd talk, which is like, oh my God, the way you hit that note on that downbeat, oh, you know, it's just like, what, what are you talking about? Um, And then on the other side of it, it's just like, how are you able to craft a, such a nuanced idea? And I'm kind of just like, dude, like, let's just, I had the idea. I did it. Um, You can have ideas as well. Like, it's not like some illustrious thing and let's just talk and connect and like, you know. If there's problems that we're facing, we'll tackle those. But also, like we can, I can totally go into zany territory as well. So if we need some extra content, like let's just go. Yeah. <laughs> I like that plan. I like that plan. Yeah. Let's for now though talk about the new yeah. single, Cody and Kiss. <laughs> you just put this out there, um, described as being perfect for a Zoom dance party, and I cannot disagree with that. It's perfect. <laughs> I think it's one of the things I like about it is that it is very just let loose kind of style, <laughs> and I think that especially right now. We need more of that. Like, mm-hmm. I love the songs that make you think, but I also like the songs that you know make you move. What was your goal in writing this? Did you kind of have a, a purpose behind it, or was it just like you said, an idea that you just wanted to put out there? Mm-hmm. So it's really funny because, like, this for this song specifically, like the process that it came about was actually like so. Like, I I can check mark off like exact the exact things. Um, so I think the first aspect of it was like just being at home and sort of like I'm I've been like familiarizing myself with recording at home and music production and so I was like you know what like if I'm going to teach myself something like at the very least I want to make something fun you know like I don't want to I my the first thing that I tackle I don't want it to be like a <laughs> like just something you know I was just like I I went out with the purpose of like I want to make something fun because I want to make this learning experience fun and then um the other thing too is that like Summer for me is usually like one of my uh, one of it has been like my busiest sort of like season as a musician. Right. Like whether it's weddings or whether it's like just gigs, people are out and about and like they're seeking that entertainment. And so I was kind of just like the past two summers of mine have just been filled with live shows and filled with dancing. And I wanted to keep up that vibe. And then um, the other the just a really funny thing, too, is that like I do exercise. I do writing exercises a lot just to sort of like keep my chops up. And there's this one exercise. It's a metaphor exercise where basically 
you can either take like you take five adjectives, five nouns, five verbs, whatever, but like they're just randomly paired together, you know? And um and I remember one day I was doing this exercise. It was like in June and it was a noun and a verb. And uh, I just, for example, codeine and kiss came up in my little random list. And I was like, why is that cool? I don't know why that's cool. Um, and as I was writing this song, like that lyric just kept popping into my head. And I was like, OK, you fuck. Like, I'm just going to write you now. Like, you're going to keep popping up. So I'm just going to write you now. And uh, and it actually just ended up lending itself super well, especially because, yeah, it was one of those. It's the I think the other big thing about the song is that like it's like this feel good dance groove song. But the the crux of the song is that just like. It's that line where I I have a line where I say it makes me feel so good that I just don't feel a thing or I can't feel anything. And um, that's kind of just like how how I felt waking up in quarantine every day for like, you know, I was like, today's going to be a great day. And then like by noon, I'm just like, what is life? And then by 3 p.m., I'm like, it's awesome. And then by 6 p.m., I'm like, I wasted the day. And then by 12 p.m., it's like, it's this is a great day. So it was just like sort of like blah, 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 like that, that sort of like seesawing to the point where I was just like, I don't know, man. I don't know what I feel anymore. This has been your uh, fifth release for the year. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how you keep the creative energy going when Mm -hmm. so much of your music career has come to the stop. Well, I think just to my earlier point, like I think that when it comes to creating stuff, I feel like I've worked hard at sort of dismantling that thought process where like if I sit down, like it's going to be like a labor of love. Like I'm just going to like, you know, just like, uh, like I, I wouldn't like, that's not how I approach it anymore. I'm kind of just like, I want to have fun and I want to like add some joy to my own day. And, um, I think that just like, just making that mental shift has actually like really freed up a lot of energy. Um, and I don't know, I think part of it too, is just like giving myself something to look forward to, you know, like I'm sure that you have things to look forward to. And when you have those things, like enter your like realm of possibility you like your mood immediately shoots up and it's kind of just like i don't like if i can make this like the cool thing about art like whether it's music or whether it's even a podcast it's just like you can make it anytime you want right and um and i think that maybe some people sort of like maybe lose sight of that because it becomes such a stressful endeavor sometimes that it's kind of just like this is a thing that's fun right and you can do it anytime you want so basically what you're saying is you can have fun anytime you want what and it's like a foreign concept to some folks. And it was to me. But I think that just like just being creative in that respect and like allowing myself to have fun is what helps me to just like crank out and stuff. And um, the other thing, too, is just like on, a, on, I guess, a bit more technical side, too. It's just like nowadays, like you're, you know, it's like your favorite artists are putting out a song like every six to eight weeks. And you're just like, oh, my God. OK, talk about staying relevant. And then the Spotify overlords are like, we'll pay you five cents a song. And then it's just like, OK, so I just need to like crank, you know. And just sort of like rolling with those punches. Yeah. That's cool. Well, especially if you can do the recording on your own too. You know, mm-hmm. one of the things that, that I've been talking to a lot with, with guests recently is they have been all building their own home studios. Because they find, you know what? I can't go to a studio. Who knows when I can actually do that again. I'll mm-hmm. just spend the money, buy my own stuff, and record at 2 in the morning because I can yeah. do that then. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's funny. It's like around like the the I think it was like around April, May. It's like um, you had all these companies that were like they sell these things called like audio interfaces. I'm sure you have one probably like when you record audio and stuff like that. But for the for the folks on that are listening that are unaware, it's basically it takes audio signals and then it converts it into a file that your computer can read. Um, and so you need like that interface. And so it's funny because like when COVID struck, it's like you had all these places that were like out of stock for of audio interfaces for like a month straight. Um, but I think it's great that like people are doing it. Like I've been doing it and like, I'm not a worse off person for, you know, trying to teach myself how to record from home and better that. So, yeah. And plus, you know, when you wake up at like three uh, thirty a.m. and say, "I have this amazing idea," you can just record mm-hmm. that shit. You don't have to say, "Yeah, well, I should wait," you know, a couple of weeks until the studio's free. It's like, no, do it right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like it's it's fun because it's like it's sort of help. It's for it's like it's holding up the mirror to these artists, including myself. It's just like, all right, what's your excuse? You don't got an excuse now. Like, what is it? Like, come on, you can do this. Like, you can do it. So, what are you actually not wanting to do? You know, you seem like the type of person who doesn't worry about a whole lot. That being said, though, when it comes to releasing uh, Coding Kiss and your other singles, do you ever worry about re- about like reaction or reception? <sighs> I think it varies. I think that like 
I've gotten better at it once again. So it's like I used to have like sort of like the most anxiety ever on release day. You know, it's like you put out a song and you're like checking the play count incessantly and you're like, oh, my God, I have two plays like I'm a failure. And then you're like, oh, it's been nine minutes, you know, <laughs> um, and the song is five minutes long. But like I think that I don't know, I think that like over time. I I feel like I've made enough mistakes on the way that like I actually like have a checklist for myself and aside from like fulfilling the checklist of like do x before release do y do z um it's also just a matter of like I think that I'm I just enjoy the stuff that I'm putting out and I think that part of it for me too is that like once again just to sort of like tie it back to the first answer it's like for 7 years no for like yeah for like 7 to 8 years of my life I was like too afraid to do this thing so I'm just I just have like a joy of like I did it like I, I had this, like I, I, there's this thing that I told myself I couldn't do for so long, and now that I'm doing it, I'm like, I did. Like that's it, you know. I'm very much the same way because when I post a new episode, I'll I'll, I'll be like checking the uh, uh, the download tracks. Okay, two downloads in like the first day. I'm shit. Mm. I'm awful. I'm terrible. I should quit right now. Everyone hates me. Yeah, it's like I mean, well, first of all, how do you deal with that? Like, or how how has that been for you? Like, <laughs> um, I think for me. What I remind myself is that, number one, there are like six trillion podcasts right now. I've got one. Mm-hmm. My neighbor's got one. My my um, my like coat rack has one. Everyone's got a podcast. <laughs> it's super nice. easy to, to start one. So everyone – like podcasts is, is, is basically blogging in 2020. Mm-hmm. Everyone's doing it. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. It's a very, very thickly stocked pool. Yeah. The other thing is if I get two downloads in one day, that's two more than I had before, and I should be happy mm-hmm. for that. Rather than say, why well, don't I have 50 or 60? Just say, you know what? I got two. I'm mm-hmm. cool with that. And certainly try to improve and say, well, how can I? Is it when I post to like my social media? Is it how I'm presenting it? Is it this or that? You know, look to improve, certainly, but don't get so bogged down that you just fall into a pit and never climb out. Yeah, yeah. I think, too, that, like, something that really helped me was, like, I think it was maybe, it was probably bigger in, like, 2015 or 2016, but I don't know if you, if you're, if you remember or recognize or, like, there was this, um, there was this Instagram account called Humans of New York. I don't know if you've, I don't know if you're familiar with it. I'm sure, like, now that they have, like, a one for, like, every state or something, but the founder of this was pretty much, like, he would take a picture of a person that he met, and then he would ask them to share, like, a little story about their lives. And, like, that, that, that platform, like, that, that, took off you know and I think that like part of it aside from the fact that it was like humanizing and it like painted other people in like a human way or like showed them in a human way I think the other thing too is that like another one of my friends always talks about like dude so long as you're adding value to like yourself and the world like that's really all that matters and like I think that it's really funny because like you know of those two downloads like somebody might hear something that you said or they heard on your show and then it becomes like their new mantra and like the other thing too is that something that i've realized is like sometimes people are like nervous about reaching out you know so it's like if you might you might have like the most die hard hardcore fan in the world but they might just be a little too shy to like reach out um but like i think that you know even like in those two downloads or in those 10 or in those 20 million or whatever it's just like if you provided that value like and then yeah. there are the spikes, you know, like the, 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 yeah. then you have the really good days. Like I did one recently with one of my, with one of my favorite uh, webcomic creators and she posted to her, to her Twitter and it was getting like, you know, liked and retweeted and commented on the downloads were just shooting up. I thought, oh, yeah. that's amazing. You know, like you have those spikes. It's like, okay, cool. And makes, it makes you feel better. But I think it also energizes you to keep doing more. Like, okay, I did this thing. Let's mm. do it again. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it also like, it just it, it it breaks that barrier of like what you thought was achievable, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's just like the moment or like the day that you like break like you know five thousand downloads or something like that. Like I know for me it was a big thing. The first time I hit ten thousand streams, I was like, oh my god, <gasps> what? And then um like one of my one of my songs nowadays like it, I think it has like three hundred thousand, and I'm like, oh my god, like I never even like didn't expect that at all, didn't anticipate that, and um yeah, it's just like I don't know you it. It it all it all like culminates. That's the other thing too. Like it all it all it all works out in the end. Yeah. I would it say. It sometimes yeah. takes a while, but eventually you yeah. do get there. I want to shift gears a bit and talk about the music scene in Brooklyn. Now I've been to New York mm. City a few times, usually for shows. And what I've seen, New York has this absolutely amazing music scene, super vibrant, a lot to do. But what's your experience actually like living in the area? 
Mm-hmm. Well, first off, I was going to ask, what's your favorite venue in like New York City? By Bowery Electric. Nice. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um. Oh, I have, yeah. I played a I played a show there like three years ago, and it was like one of my favorites for sure. It was like maybe like top two or three. Um. Yeah, I think that like it's cool because I think in in any in any big pool, as you know, like imagine like let's say you took like two thousand people who wanted to be professional podcasters and you threw them in the same borough, and then you like you know, let them interact and intersect with one another. It's kind of just like, it's one of those things where within those, within each sort of group, like, or not, which, whatever, which in, I guess, any sort of field, you're going to find sort of different, like, strata of folks. So like, for example, like, you'll find the people who are just like, I just want to make it big right now. You'll find the other people who are like, I just want to write good songs. You'll have other people who are like, I'm just trying to get my name out there. You'll have other people who are like, I want to start a band, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that just like, I think that in terms of musicians relating to musicians, it can almost be like dating because it's just like you really have to like meet as many people as you can and see who you really mesh with community wise. Um, but I think as the scene as a whole, it's awesome because like you have such a wide variety of people that like you're not going to be left for wanting for like, man, I really it's been so long since I've heard like trap polka funk ska music. Like, damn, no, one, I don't hear that anywhere. But it's like you probably find it in Brooklyn or New York in some way, shape or form. Um, so in that respect, I think it's great. Um, I also hope that in general, like the city bounces back because I, uh, you know, as I'm sure you, you know, as I'm sure you can understand, like every city has its own like pool of venues that are indie. They're not like the big rooms, but it's the place where people, you know, get their start and can pop into on a Friday or Saturday night. And for like a drink or two, just like damn or hang out for a bit so yeah i mean i mean i'm i'm, I'm confident that like well there's like a light at the end of the tunnel um and yeah oh yeah definitely definitely i yeah. i lived in boston for about eight years and one of my favorite things was friday night get up from work drop mm-hmm. off the work stuff put on your like show your show gear you know like yeah. your band t-shirt and yeah hit the road and find a show and boston always has so much to do so oh, many, it, yeah like, you know great venues some are you know, shutting down unfortunately, but that those that have closed, the owners are saying mm-hmm. we're not we're not done. We're gonna reopen. Yeah, we're already, we're already talking about like this location, that location. So you're seeing that energy and that entrepreneurial spirit from the people in Boston. So likewise, mm-hmm. I do see that things will eventually change. The music scene will bounce back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fingers crossed. It's like sooner rather than later. But yeah, it's 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 just I think it's just like a waiting game. But also, it's funny that you mentioned energy because like it's like energy that you don't like energy doesn't go away. It's like not destroyed, you know, it's just floating every there and it'll, it'll come back. Like it'll, it'll manifest itself in some way. Yeah. Maybe that sounds a little too Einstein-y theory of relativity ish, but like, you I like, I like it. actually. Well, I, 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 right. I like it. How did you channel your energy, especially in the early days? Cause I know that like New York was like the hardest hit for a long time. How did you mm-hmm. like rechannel your energy? So you weren't just stretching the fuck out all the time. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I think this is important for me to say for anybody who's listening who might possibly see what I've been doing and be like, man, this guy is like the Energizer Bunny. He like goes nonstop. It's kind of like, ah, uh, I spent like the first month of quarantine just like asleep and sad. You know, it was like, I, that's, that's possibly me being dr- melodramatic, but like, I definitely like, you know, there were long days of like, I'm going to like sleep nine to 10 to 12 hours today. I'm going to like wake up. I'm going to like try to sort of center my life and like do at least one productive thing. Um, or like one small thing for myself. Um, and so like early stages of quarantine, it was definitely kind of like, I think it was, I think right off the bat, it was like making sure that I could be in a place where like the, like, you know, I don't want to say bad thoughts, but like worst case scenario ideas weren't like always knocking on the door. And, uh, and yeah, I think that, um, that's, that's pretty much like how I spent like the first month and a half or so. And then like slowly but surely, I just started stacking on like little things every day. And then also just like doing things that were low stress and made me happy. And yeah. Now, I know you've got a music video in the works for Cody and Kiss set to be released mm-hmm. on November 19th. So the time of this recording, this is the 12th. It's a week away. Yes, sir. What can folks expect from this? Um, it's pretty goofy. Um, which I think that like for those who have either seen me live or know me personally, they're like, this is not a surprise. Like he's not acting in this video. He's like, it's like being himself. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, I mean, yeah, I might as well just talk about the plot, you know, just cause I, part of me is like, I want to keep it a secret. But the other part of me is like, it's actually just, it's a funny plot in itself. Uh, when I was, when I was coming up with a concept for the video, I was like, 
what can I do to sort of like put a put a fresh twist on that whole narrative of like guy wants girl back, guy whines, like guy wishes he could get girl back. Mar, mar, mar. And um and what I actually ended up doing was uh it's funny, I actually made the uh made the focus of the song about a dog. Um and so the way it works is like the opening scene is me approaching like my ex's uh, ex's apartment, and I'm just like, "Hey, can I take him for a walk?" And she's like, "You can't do this anymore." And I'm like, "Please!" And um and I keep pestering her, and she's like, "You know, we're getting a restraining order." And then I'm just like, "Okay, well, fine." And then, um, long story short, it does end up with a dog napping, but it's a very it's a safe dog napping, and it's very it's it's goofy and it's whimsical and like, it's just it's yeah, it was just something just to be quirky and funny and not take itself seriously that was like the whole point of it you know yeah i'll actually I'll, it's funny i'll even send you like a private link so I, yeah oh yeah dog yeah, napping yeah. i you, you know is it dog napping if it was once your dog though food, fair food fair for point thought. food for thought i i need if you have you ever considered a profession in law max no i have not and that's <laughs> the best actually um how did you go about recording this given you know the lockdowns and the restrictions mm-hmm. and so forth. Yeah. Well, um, I think that like right off the bat, what really helped is that I had friends who, uh, my pr- pretty much two of my friends, both from college, actually it is their dog. And so they live together. Like they have this pup and, um, and I was like, all right, right off the bat, like we pretty much have our lineup of characters and it's three humans and a puppy. And then, um, the, the shots that I didn't really have in mind weren't super complex. It was mainly just really funny cuts. So I knew that we would only need one camera. And then I had my close friend Wyatt, uh, come on to direct it. And so, um, what is it just in terms of like the first step was like compiling a small team. So it was just five people. It was like my friend Wyatt directing, um, his pal, John, who came on, who did all the videography stuff. And then my two friends, uh, Suzanne and Nick, and then their pup. And then the other part of it was just like making sure everybody got a test before. And then we were, once we were in the clear, it was just like a single day of shooting. You know, it was just, it was a long day, but, uh, but it was just like in and out and sort of just like making sure that we, uh, yeah, we just had a good time. Really, that was it. Yeah, nice. And does the pup get screen credit? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's funny. I like. I had a so my two friends, Nick and Suzanne. We had this deal when I pitched them the idea. I was like, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna do my best to make your dog. His name is Bobka. I was like, I'm gonna do my best to get Bobka famous. And they were like, Okay, all right, deal. We're in for this. And I was like, Cool, we got it. You know. <laughs> Can a dog get um, SAG? credits for this oh right i wanted to get i want him to get like a little card or something yeah, like a yeah, union seriously card. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is there like a branch of sag for animals this dog would actually i mean like you'll like i'll show you once again i'll just send you the video but it's funny it's like i think that this dog would be amazing in film and like with purina endorsements like through the roof and like i think that you know if there is like an animal league or something like that like animal pr agents or whatever like they're going to be after this dog and oh, yeah. good things will happen yeah <laughs> yeah you figure there probably must be because you think of all those like uh, sitcoms that had like the family dog on like every, mm-hmm. every episode. Well, I mean, someone's got to unionize that dog. Yeah, I was gonna say. I hope Air Bud is like a billionaire. Yeah. Like <laughs> Air Bud is like all set. You well, know, Air Bud probably passed away. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I also read that like um, they actually like had multiple Air Buds, <laughs> which is like yeah. Spoiler did. alert for anybody. It's kind of it's, it's kind of messed. It, up. It's not the same dog. <laughs> It's not the same. Yeah. <laughs> Breaking all the hearts right now. Um, so to avoid that, let's talk <laughs> about funk, which is your yeah. kind of brand of music. It's your style. This blend of like funk and pop. And I definitely get both of those listening to your songs. But how do you weave them together? I um, I more or less like I, I started off playing guitar and I come from like a more or less like jazzy background. And so like. Originally, like when I when I approach songwriting, like the thing about jazz and songwriting is that they're not really the best of pairs because you have like somebody who like wants to sing like a very simple melody, you know, and then you have jazz where it's like, you know, it's just like, let me play every single note twice. Um, And it's funny because like moving like I think one of the things about funk music that really attracts me to it is that it's not like it's not simple in any way, but it, it it comes off as simple because it's so like precise you know and so it's like you have like these really cool things happening in like a horn section or something but uh but like you know what you're hearing is actually like a jazz school kid like myself would be like oh you know like you'd have like a like a a mini orgasm like oh my god it's amazing and um 
And just like, it's funny because when I, I had a moment where I was like, you know what, I do want to write music that's like widely accessible to people. Um, and I think that by virtue of its definition, like that's what pop music is. It's just popular music. Um, and it pretty much just means that like the, the general audience is as big as it can be. And so what I really want to do is like, I really want to take like this sort of like rhythmic, like harmonically sort of precise, but also complex music and then combine it with like the simple energy that is pop. Like pop is more or less an energy and it's just like <laughs> squish them together. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, I don't, I definitely, I just wanted to really come up with a term for it. Um, it's funny because like when I think if somebody was like you, that's a funky sound, it's like, I would even think of like somebody like Bruno Mars or somebody and I'd be like, that's really cool. But like, I really wanted the word and I wanted the credit and I wanted to, I sort of wanted to use it as like a branding tool for myself. Cause yeah, that's, um, I also think that's another thing too, that like I've, it's taken me a while to learn, which is like the whole branding aspect, you know? Well, you got the oddballs, you got right? funk. So I think you've, you need to get the branding thing down, you know, you gotta like We're put working, these labels yeah. on things. We're working on it. I actually get a brand, actually, like an actual brand, and just start branding things. You know, just like pretty sure you can't do that to people. Oh, definitely won't do it to people. Definitely won't. Okay, good. Just like good. trees and stuff. I'll just be like, <laughs> like what's that? What's can you? Do... Yeah. I can just, just like see... a whole farm of cows, just like their butts, just say flunk. It's just like a line of. Cows. <laughs> meanwhile, the, meanwhile, uh, the farmer's like, "What the hell happened here?" Yeah, it's like what in tarnish? It's like old McDonald's show. Like <laughs> you're just like, and you're just like running away, jumping the fence. It's like so long, bye. <laughs> you're like download my stream on your <laughs> Find me on Facebook and Instagram. Like and subscribe. Right? <laughs> hey, whatever it takes, man. You know, whatever and, it takes, and, and yeah. you gotta go unique. You got you gotta go, with, you know, creative. Speaking mm. of which, I want to talk about your social media because your mm. Facebook game is solid. You know, okay. you know yeah. the pictures, what you post, how you post. Do you kind of plan this this stuff out? Is it more spontaneous? Um. Oh no, it's definitely planned out. But I think that like. I think that every sort of release that I do, I wanted to have an arc um, and communicate like more or less a story. And I think that like, what's really cool is that like you can almost pre not, you can preemptively influence like what your listeners are going to know about the song just by the branding associated with like, you know, pumping up the release and all that. And um, I think that for me, like the whole, that whole aspect is the most important because I definitely want to, like, once again, I know that I make something just the same way that you do. It's like you you make something and once it's out in the world, like it's free to be interpreted however, however you please um, or however the other person pleases to interpret it. But I definitely think that when it comes to my music, I, at the very least, I would sort of like like to influence like maybe you want to enter it or approach it from this angle. You know, maybe I think that you might enjoy that a lot and it might uh, it might help them and you sort of like understand my headspace a little better. So in that respect, like the planning is pretty like, like I'll spend like a, maybe an hour, an hour and a half every Sunday and just like figure out like what I want to do for the week and what my mission is, you know? Cause honestly, like some weeks it's kind of just like stay relevant, you know, some weeks that is the mission. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, it's once again, it's like its own, it's its own weird thing as I'm sure you know, cause like social media is its own, I want to say job, but yeah, it's like, it is a job, you know? It really is, and I think it's one of the most important things about being an artist is you need to be out there and you need to be active. And one of the things that I think I really took from yours is that the photos are such high quality, it's very professional. This isn't like some like shitty like cell phone photo where like the lighting is off and the photo looks grainy. This is like this is like really really high quality. So but this is a guy mm-hmm. who is willing to take that extra step to stand out. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I also think that it's kind of just like something that I noticed when it came to like websites, like, you know, like go back like 10 years ago or like 12 years ago. And it's just like, if you met somebody at a party and they're like, I have a website and you're like, Oh oh my God, what? You know? Um, and now it's like, you know, it's like, yeah, exactly. It's like the Macaulay Culkin, like, Oh, you know? Um, and like, you know, maybe fast, maybe rewind like six, seven years later, you know, it's just like you have an Instagram with 400 followers, <gasps> you know, it's like the same reaction. But like nowadays, it's like everybody, like you said, like your coat rack probably has an Instagram. Um, and it's just like, how do you differentiate beyond that? And it's just like, oh, the quality has to be like super top level, you know, and just finding different ways to sort of like stand out, not even almost stand out sometimes, but just like be in the what's right. We're saying this like be in contention with the other things that are out there, you know? 
what is next for you? You have mm-hmm. a new single. What's on your radar? Yeah. Um, so, like, I'm a planner. I'm a planner type person, and I think that I also work better when I have goals. Um, to sort of because, like, the other thing too is that like I'll make things for fun, but like also if you leave me be, like I'll make a bunch of things, but I might not like, polish them or finish them up. I'll be like, here's like 50 songs. I'd be like, what are you gonna do with them? I'd be like, I actually don't know. You know. Um, and so I think that like planning ahead for the future. Definitely November and December, I'm definitely going to take a sort of like time to like, you know, like power down as I'm sure like most folks are and just make sure that like going into 2021, you know, just having like a positive outlook or at the very least like taking care of myself. Um, But in February, I want to release a single um, March as well. And then I think that starting May, May and June, I'll, I'll put out two singles from what I hope to be will be like my first LP, which will be out in July. So that's um yeah that's a that's a it's a long game it's a long term game but uh, I'm excited for that and like I think that the goal for this year is to just like put out an album you know well Francis man this has been a lot of fun I am happy to be now counted among the oddballs of the world yes, thank- where do folks go though to learn more about you and to check your work out yeah also thank you thank you once again for having me and like thanks for listening to me ramble on and make weird exasperated noises like Wah! um. What was I going to say? Yes, if folks would like to find me, um, just Francis with an I, um, A-U-D dot com. And then um, on, I was very lucky that nobody had that name. So if you'd like to search me on any social media platforms, it's just Francis Odd and music at the end. So yeah, Francis Odd music and then Francis Odd dot com. Hi, this is singer Kate Eppers and you're listening to Citywide Blackout. Hey everyone, Max Bowen here. If you're a longtime listener of the show, you know how much I love Comixology. This is the best place to go for digital comics from every company out there, from the big two to independent creator-owned titles. Well, folks, the big news is that they are hitting the presses. In the spring of 2021, they'll be teaming up with Dark Horse Comics, publisher of titles such as Black Hammer, Hellboy, and Sin City, my personal favorite, to distribute print editions of Comixology Originals, graphic novels, and collections. This is going to include the Eisner Award winner, Afterlift, along with Breaklands, Youth, and The Black Ghost. I have read most of these titles. They are amazing. I cannot wait to add them to my bookshelf. Now, these will be available in comic shops, bookstores, and libraries. And more will be announced in the weeks and months to come. But if you want all the updates, go to ComixologyOriginals.com and follow them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. All right, folks, that brings this episode to a close. You can follow the show on Facebook under Citywide Blackout and Twitter and Instagram under Citywide Max. Listen to the show on Podbean, Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, and every Saturday at 10 p.m. on Boston Free Radio. To close things out, I've got the new single for you, Cody and Kiss. As always, keep those ears open.
just can't explain it Love it and I hate it Keep me medicated You're my fucking favorite I just can't explain it Keep me medicated You're my fucking favorite